I'm not exactly sure um, how this is going to go, what we're going to do. I've got like this thing uh, in my heart to do a series from now to Easter on the cross. Um, it's, it's in my heart, it's in my, not in my mind yet, so it's kind of just stirring around in me. So tonight I'm, I'm bringing something on the cross that I feel is kind of like our kickoff point. Um, I'm not really wanting to get into a theological or doctrinal kind of approach. I'm not trying to, uh, you know, get into regeneration, sanctification, salvation, and atonement, and all of that. I mean, that's all there, but I, that's not the point. What's in my heart is to bring something of the cross. We've been talking a lot about uh, the new and living way. Uh, and associate the cross with the new and the living way, a meaningful, well, meaningful way to live the new and living way, if you would. Um, Jesus talked about the cross before he ever went to the cross. Um, you'll remember him saying, you know, picking up your cross daily and all that. Uh, to clarify that a little bit, in Jesus' day, that terminology, the cross had been around but it had been around for a long time before even the Romans used it for crucifixion. The cross itself was always a symbol for suffering. So Jesus being Eastern, which is what the Middle East is, is Eastern, he would have used that terminology basically in saying, listen, if you're going to walk with me, it's going to involve a certain amount of suffering. So be prepared for suffering. This is not a Sunday school picnic. It really kind of makes our 20th century theology makes us scratch our heads a bit for those who don't see how suffering works with the Christian walk when in fact Jesus said you, you can't actually have a Christian walk without suffering quite frankly so the element of suffering is built into our spiritual DNA when it comes to um, when it comes to our, our, our Christian walk so Jesus talked about the cross in the context of suffering. He ended up going to, to the cross himself. Paul says a lot about the cross, more than anybody else, actually. He seems to, be, um, he seems to have a lot to say, more than uh, James and Peter and John. And he seems to have uh, more to say about it. Now, I'm looking at, like I say, from now until Easter, a long time of talking about the cross. Tonight I just want to go to John 3 and take a look at, as far as I can tell, the first time that Jesus makes a reference to the cross in his own life being crucified. Um, and it's in John 3. John's Gospel um, is filled with symbolism, a lot of almost like spiritual codes and messages, a lot of... Uh, spiritual keys if you would it's to me it's the most fascinating of the gospels because of the spirituality that's contained in it and john 3 jesus's conversation with nicodemus really kind of uh, sets us up for the whole nature of trying to walk and talk with jesus so to speak in the sense that uh He's always speaking a spiritual language that we're not quite getting. He's walking in the light, we're walking in the dark. He's talking about heavenly things, we're talking about earthly things. So even when it comes to the cross, he wants to bring a heavenly spiritual message. Nicodemus really kind of epitomizes all of us and just not getting it. Just not getting it. It's not connecting because we're speaking two different languages. So I'm going to take this apart little by little. Um, verses 1 and 2. If somebody wants, in John chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do the signs that you do unless God is with him. Spiritual message. He comes to Jesus by night. That's John's way of saying the guy is walking in darkness. Spiritually, he's walking in darkness. He comes by night. He comments to Jesus, you know, we know that you're a man from God because we can see the signs. He's a Pharisee. He's very external oriented. We see the signs. I could see those. 
and they tell me that you're a man of God. He's going by the external. The Pharisees, as you know, were very external oriented. They liked the show, they wore the robes, they liked the best places, you know, uh, at banquets, the whole thing. I mean, Jesus gives them a list of woes, and the, all of the woes have to do with you're so concerned about the externals, the way you appear, all this kind of stuff instead of the internal working. So we've got this man coming to Jesus, Nicodemus. He expresses a solidarity with a group of other people. He says, we know. You notice what he said. We know that you're, you know, from God. Um, and the external for Nicodemus is where it's at. Now, would you just read the beginning of what you, at the first verse again? One more time. I'll stop you. Now there was a man. That's far enough. There was a man. There was a man. I said a few minutes ago that Nicodemus is going to sort of epitomize us, really. There was a man. Let's forget Nicodemus. There was a man. And I just want to pull you into the way John thinks. Um, Russ, would you go back to the first chapter of John? And Aaron, would you go to the second chapter of John? And I'll give you guys some verses. In John, the first chapter, would you read the sixth verse? There came a man sent from God whose name was John. Okay, so there was a man. Actually, it's the same exact word. There was a man whose name was John. So we got, there is a man. Would you drop down to 34? And I have seen and borne witness that this is the Son of God. So this man, John the Baptist, we're told a lot in the first chapter. There was a man, his name was John. Bada bing, bada bing, bada bing, bada bing. And his testimony was this. I have seen and I testify to you. I have seen. I've seen. This becomes important by what Jesus is going to say to Nicodemus. I have seen that this man is the Son of God. In chapter 2, would you read verse 10? This is after the, the, the waters turned to wine. And he said to him, Every man at the beginning sets out the good wine. And when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior. You have kept the good wine until now. Every man puts out the good wine first. But you have done the opposite. You have brought out the best wine at the end. Every man sees humanity and man as the best wine. The truth is, we run out of wine. We run out of that. And the best man, by God's plan all along, like Paul talks about, first comes the natural, then the spiritual, that what we consider to be like the best wine is nothing compared to the spiritual. This is a message that's going through here. Every man buys into that. First the natural, then the spiritual. Now would you drop down, and we're going to read this a little bit differently. It's unfortunate that John 3 begins where it begins. Because if you start at verse 23 of the second chapter, Aaron, mm -hmm. and read through verse 1, see if it reads a little bit differently. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself to them, because he knew all men, and no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in a man, what was in man. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. So let's stop there. You got you to get yourself in John's mindset. John says that at the Passover in Jerusalem, many people saw the signs. What does Nicodemus say? We've seen the signs, and we know that you're from God. What does it say in John 2? They saw the signs, and many believed, because they saw the signs. They had an external witness, they saw the signs, and they believed. But Jesus did not commit himself to them, because he knew what was in man. So, there was a man, Nicodemus. See, John is still on, John who wrote the Gospel, not John Baptist, is still on describing there's a condition of man that Nicodemus epitomizes, and there's a condition of Jesus who's trying to bring man from his spiritual condition, his earthly mindset, his external focus 
on rituals and religion and all that. He's trying to bring him from that to something internal, to something spiritual. There's a journey that needs to take place. Otherwise, all we're stuck with is externals, religion, man, so to speak. Let's continue on. All I really want to establish in the very beginning of the chapter is there is a difference between Nicodemus and Jesus. And they are polar opposites with light, dark. Very clearly, concentrating on the external, concentrating on the internal. One of the reasons I get kind of antsy at times when I hear about people freaking out about Signs and Wonders conferences is all I see is a fascination with the external. Where God, what God is doing is an internal work in every one of us. That's what he's looking at while we're looking at something else. We're playing Nicodemus. I've seen the signs. And Jesus is saying, well, let's continue reading. We'll see. Verses 3 and 4 in chapter 3. Anybody? Jesus answered and said to him, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Now, Nick hears the word again. Your Bible said again. A lot of Bibles say again. But the word isn't, it could be used to be again. But it can't be an again in terms of a second time. In other words, the word actually means anew or from above. You must, Jesus was saying, you must be born anew, not again. But Nick, Nick is natural minded. He's physical minded. What he hears is you must be born again. In other words, you were born one time. You must be born again. And Jesus is saying, no, Jesus is speaking a spiritual language. You must be born anew, indicating you must be born. It actually means, you know, from above. You see, Nick would have known Psalm 127 that says children are a heritage from the Lord. So we know children come from the Lord. In Nick's mind, it only happens once. And he's right. He's exactly right. You don't get born twice. You only get born once. But what Jesus is talking about is not about the physical, natural birth. He's talking about a spiritual birth. But Nicodemus is trying to keep things in the natural realm. Remember, we have seen the signs. We're very familiar with the external and the natural and the physical and the whole thing. If he would have thought of life like he would have thought of death, you know, like in John 11, when Jesus says that Lazarus is not going to die, he dies, but, he says, but he's not going to die. Well, is Jesus lying or what? No, Jesus is, everybody knew that there were two deaths. There was the one when you leave here, and then there's another one, should you die um, in judgment. If Nicodemus would have switched on to life the way the Bible talks about death, then he would have started to come to a place of saying, wait a minute, this guy's talking about that we are born, but then there's a rebirth, a type of a being birthed anew that he's talking about that I don't really know what he's talking about. But instead... Nicodemus takes it, he hears, being born again. That it's going to happen a second time. What Jesus is talking about is being born anew that is as dramatic. We cannot relate. I wish we could. I wish Micah could really talk because he would remember. At nine months, seriously, at nine months old, he'd remember. He would remember. You know, I remember nine months ago I was like in a relatively dark place and there was fluid all around me and the way I ate was entirely different than the way I eat now. The way I receive sustenance from the same person I receive sustenance from now. But he could explain all of that. And then what happened, Micah? I haven't a clue. All I know is I came out and all of a sudden the fluid was gone. There was this error around me. I was no longer in the same place, I was in a different... I mean, as dramatic as he could explain that, that's what Jesus is trying to explain, but not in a natural way, in a spiritual way. Wow. That when you're born anew, when you come in flesh and blood and you're born, 
if you're going to see the kingdom of heaven, it's kind of unfortunate that we've made such a huge doctrine over re regeneration. Because I think in all of our doctrinalizing that we're missing something very important. It was never meant to be a doctrine. It was meant to be a reality of the spirit that once you're born anew in the spirit, everything changes. It is as dramatic as the natural birth, the first birth. Mm -hmm. Amen? Mm -hmm. I mean, an entirely different reality, but if you're still focusing and concentrating like Nicodemus on the external, the natural, if you're in darkness, what did John say about darkness? Would somebody read the first in John 1 verses 4 and 5? Life was in him and his life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. The light shines in darkness and the darkness doesn't get it. 